Rising, more recently remembered as a rebadged racy wrong way, have been relaunched as the rather more relevant Rising Auto. Try saying that when you're drunk. They are a standalone EV brand of SAIC, sitting above Wrongway and MG and below IM Motors. They have two cars. First one is a large SUV coupe, the R7, and now they've got this, the Rising F7. Yes, this is the Rising F7, a rather heavily sculpted, rather streamlined, large family sedan. Except that it's not really a sedan, it's actually a hatchback, but I'll explain that when we get towards the back. But as I said, quite heavily sculpted. We've got sharp creases here all along the front, quite a pointy, sharp nose front end, enhanced by these large and aggressive daytime running lights, which for once on a Chinese car are not connected in the middle, which does set it apart from the competition a little bit. We've got quite aggressive air curtains around the wheel there. As we come to the side, the sculpting continues with a double belt line. Across the front axle and the rear axle, we've got sharp sculpting here, and then a lower belt line, a more horizontal one between the doors. And together with the black plastic at the bottom there, it does help to squeeze the height of this car, make it look a bit lower, a bit more lithe, a bit more streamlined. And as I said, it is very streamlined actually. A drag coefficient of just 0.206 makes it one of the most effective cars at cutting through the air in this category. Supporting that, of course, are these 19 inch aero wheels. Now, I don't like aero wheels on any car, to be honest, least of all on an SAIC car because they do tend to have wheels that look too small for the car. You can get them with 20 inch alloys that do look a bit better, still a little bit too small. At least with these 19 inches, you get a decent bit of side cushion, side wall there, so that you get more comfort while you're driving. You get pop out door handles here. Notice, by the way, there's no LiDAR on this one, but you can order LiDAR with this car. And as we come towards the rear, you can see that rather sloping, streamlined fastback approach here to the rear tailgate. You get a large daytime running light all across the back here, split in the middle by this light up rising logo, which is also light up on the front as well. You get fake air outlets there to make it look a bit more aggressive and sporty. Gloss black plastic diffuser down there. Bow tie shaped fog light as well. And as I mentioned, it's a hatch, not a sedan. So in here, you get a quite useful 466 liters of space, which compares quite favorably to the Neo ET7, Xpeng P7, Hyper GT, other cars in this category. You also get 60-40 folding rear seats. What you don't get though, is a parcel shelf. So anything in the trunk, people can see that through the rear window, so not exactly secure. But at least it's a large space and does make up for the fact that we don't get a frunk on this car. I think it's quite stylish actually. It's a quite aggressive, quite lithe, quite athletic looking car. Inside, there's really only one place to start, which is of course by this enormous dashboard screen here. They call it a 43 inch screen. It very much looks inspired by the MBUX hyper screen in Mercedes-Benz cars. And just like that one, it's actually split up into three individual screens. We get a 10.25 inch screen here behind the steering wheel, usual functions on there. In the middle, it's a 15 inch screen running on the Snapdragon 8155 processor. So nice and quick. And over here, if I tap on that one, you can see it, I can't. That is a 12.3 inch screen just for the passenger and I can't get distracted by it, which is great. But coming onto the middle screen here, we get the rising OS system, and it's pretty good actually. You get your swipey ventilation functions across the bottom with your temperature as well. You get your 360 degree camera, put it on 3D, nice and quick there. You can spin around with that, automatic parking function in there as well. And you can also adjust your chairs in here. So we have heated steering wheel, heated seats in the front and in the rear, also ventilated seats front and rear, although the ventilation weirdly is only on the backrest. We also get in this car a hot stone massage function. So you get a load of different functions here for hot stone massage and apparently it's credited by a massage association. So can't ask for more than that, I suppose. But it's a very good system. It's nice and quick. You get apps in there. You also get karaoke. You can get rising auto speakers, which they kindly gave me. I'm not going to treat you to me singing on video. I'm very sorry about that. We get Baidu maps in here. In the menu, you get quite a lot of functionality. So in the first menu, you get this 3D car that rotates. You can click on the lights, the mirrors, the windows, the charging port, or even the tailgate and control all of those functions from inside the car. Get a lot of the functions here like seats, mirrors, and doors and things like that. You can adjust your ambient lighting on the screens. You get your autonomous driving functions and support. 
in there, kind of front and rear assist, lane crossing, autonomous driving, and you get a few functions in here for your car menus. You can have it in sporty mode, eco mode, or snow. You can also adjust the suspension or the dynamism of the suspension. Quite useful to have that on sport. It feels much more better in sport than it does on the normal mode, which feels a little bit boaty, quite slack, I would say, in the steering. You also get in here ability to adjust your steering, make it heavier, it's not necessarily with feel, but I'll talk about that in the driving section. And also you can change your brake sensitivity as well. Don't put it on sport. It's a little bit too aggressive for my liking. So a very good system in there. And we also get a nice kind of artistic background here with a Van Gogh style painting moving around in the background. The best part about this car almost certainly is the seats because as you can see, we get extending base cushions. Yes. 53 to 58 centimeter base cushions here. So you get full support right under your thighs. Really easy to get a good driving position. You also get a lot of tilt angle on here. So very easy to find the right driving position. You do get a manually adjustable steering. This is as far as it comes. So could do with a little tiny bit more, but it's not that bad. We get Tesla style ball wheels on here, four buttons on there. You can activate your autonomous driving with this one on the left side. Elsewhere, we also get electric release doors reasonable size door pockets, more space under the dash with USB-C and USB-A sockets. We get a tray in the center console and a bit more space under there, as well as a glove box. And of course our two cup holders here as well. We also get a 16 speaker system. So we've got two in the door there, one at the base of the A pillar. I don't think it's full surround sound because we don't have higher up ones in here, but it's a decent system actually, fairly punchy, decent bass, even though it is not branded. We also get two speakers here in the headrest that are specifically for sat nav instructions. And you can also adjust it so that the normal audio comes out through your headrest. And one other feature I wanna mention before we go from the front, we also have this charging section here and you can switch between CLTC and dynamic range. CLTC, 576 kilometers, dynamic based on how we're driving, 449. So we're losing about 20 to 25% of range from CLTC, which is about accurate usually. So that's quite a useful function to have in there when checking your range. Passengers in the rear seat of the F7 are pretty well catered for as well. We get decent amounts of space and actually quite comfortable chairs. These are very nicely sculpted. It does feel quite comfortable on your back. And on the higher versions of this car, you can use this button here to adjust your backrest angle. On our car, we don't have that option. But they are quite comfortable. Good knee room, as you can see. Foot room is a bit more limited because the front seat is as low as it gets. And decent headroom above our head as well, thanks to this two meter squared panoramic roof above our heads, which does a great job actually of keeping the UV light out of the car, keeps you a bit cooler inside. But of course the headline act here in the back is the eight inch screen, which is apparently the only one in this market segment where you can watch TV in the back, different from what they're watching in the front. So you can click on the clock here, you can see here we've got our TV. Let's click on Ichii there. You can watch your TV in the back here. Very nice indeed. Don't know if you can connect Bluetooth speakers to this or something so that you can listen to different audio to those in the front, but you can watch movies in there, you can watch TV, reality shows and things. You can adjust your ambient lighting here in the back. You can adjust your ventilation, temperature and speed. You can turn on your heating and ventilation on these back chairs. And also you can just put a clock on there as well and adjust this front seat and move it out of the way if you want more legroom on that side. So a lot of comfortable features in the back of this car. We also get in here a rather large and quite heavy armrest. Feels like it's straight out of an IML7, to be honest. You can get your cup holders here, pressing down on them, pull them up to close them down again. That's quite funky. USB-C, USB-A sockets in there. So yeah, actually in the back, I think we're pretty well catered for. Now, like most of the cars in this segment, the F7 comes with a choice of either single or dual motor. Single motor versions are on the rear axle, 250 kilowatts and 450 newton meters of torque. So quite a lot of torque, certainly for a single motor car. If you go for the dual motor version, you will add an additional 150 kilowatt motor on the front axle, another 250 newton meters of torque, in total 400 kilowatts and 700 newton meters of torque. So quite punchy. Single motors will get to 100 kilometers per hour in just 5.7 seconds. Not bad for a single motor, but not quite as quick as the 4.9 seconds of the Hyper GT. The, the dual motor version will do the same sprint in 3.7 seconds, right up there with the top cars in this category. Question is, can the chassis handle all that power? Can't talk about the dual motor version because I haven't tried it. Certainly in this car, if you punch it out of a junction, 
put a bit of steering lock on, you can definitely get the back end to step out a little bit before the traction control gathers it all back in again. It's a bit smile inducing, you do get a bit of wheel spin, it's quite fun, but yeah, it doesn't quite grab it, maybe as quick as some of the other cars do. Now I'll be honest with you, when I first drove this car, I thought the handling was quite shocking. I gave it a bit of a, pushed it a little bit on the road, and I felt that the actual output of the car was about half a second later than the input that I was putting in on the steering. It felt quite boat-like in the handling. I thought, oh, not a big fan of this. But I did then find a setting in the system where I was able to change the dynamic chassis balance and move it more towards the sporty sense. And I'm not sure what it changed, but it certainly improved things because the steering tightened up, became much more precise. The overall body control became much more flattening and, and steady. So actually, it's not that bad. Not as bad as I first thought it was. Definitely don't put it on the softest setting because it does feel a little bit weird. Maybe more comfort oriented, like, you know, to be honest, many Chinese cars in this category. The ride quality on the whole, no matter what setting you've got it in, is pretty good. 95% of the time, maybe 96, 7%, totally fine. If you get over some more rough surfaces with high frequency bumps, it does start to get a bit of scuttle shake. You get a bit of that, the headrest actually started rattling, which was a little bit annoying. But overall, the majority of the time, it's quite fine. I'm not gonna say that the steering is particularly strong or particularly you know, precise or feelsome. You can change the settings to make it really soft or heavier, but even in heavy setting, which I've got now, doesn't feel particularly, certainly not quite as precise, or nowhere near as precise actually, as the Hyper GT was. I thought that was quite, quite an enjoyable feeling for very light steering. This one is heavier, but a bit more dull, I would say, in terms of the steering feel. But at least it's certainly very quiet in this car, and that's kind of because, A, it's an electric car, so they are, but we do get double glazing on the windscreen and on all four doors, so we can nullify nearly all the outdoor sounds, which does make it a very comfortable car overall, whether you're in the front seats or in the back watching your little eight inch TV down there. So I think that's pretty much what this car is geared towards. It's more for the Chinese style customers that like to be transported in comfort and luxury. Now, when it comes to batteries, much like the Hyper GT and of course the Neo ET7, SAIC now, when it comes to batteries, much like the Hyper GT and, of course, the Neo ET7, SAIC have gone with battery swapping ability. Now, it's not yet activated on this car, so you can't actually do it yet, but you get a choice of two batteries, and apparently both of them will be battery swap capable at some point. They do have some battery swap stations, and apparently they can do changes in just 20 seconds, which is bloody lightning quick. But as of, as of yet, you can't yet do it on this car. As of yet, they also don't have that many battery swap stations. They are doing a, they have an agreement with Alton New Energy, which is a battery swap company that do some battery swaps in Beijing and places like that. And they're planning to open 10,000 battery swap stations by 2025, which will make it a more viable option really for customers as and when. And that battery swap option, by the way, will, if you do a battery rental model, as you do with a Neo, will lower the starting price of this car to about 145,000 RMB which is under 20,000 pounds for a five meter long, full size electric sedan slash hatchback. That's not bad at all. I'll come on to the other prices later on. In terms of those batteries, as I said, we get two sizes, 77 kilowatt hours and 90 kilowatt hours. Single motor versions get the option of both. If you have the single motor version like we do, you get a CLTC range of 576 kilometers. In reality, as the system says, in dynamic mode, more like about 450. If you have the longer range battery on the single motor version, you'll get up to 666 kilometers of range. And the larger battery is the only one available on the dual motor version. In that, it will get 600 kilometers of range. Now, until that battery swapping capability comes in, you're relying on your DC fast charging. And we don't have a number specifically for how quickly the battery can charge, but they do say 30 to 80% in 30 minutes, which to be honest is absolutely standard, quite average, not particularly quick, not particularly slow, right down the middle, I would say, in terms of charging. Now, as I said, it is quite a long car, five meters, exactly, actually, right down to the millimeter. It's also 1.494 meters tall and 1.953 meters wide with a three meter wheelbase. Big long wheelbase in this, gives you quite a lot of legroom front and back. And as I said before, let's touch on the pricing. 
the battery rental option, which is not yet available, will start this car at 145,000 RMB, is what was said previously. We'll have to see if it actually is still carried out in future. Other than that though, if you start for the normal version of this car, single motor, smallest battery, you'll start at 209,900 RMB, which is basically 25,000 pounds or $31,700 at the current exchange rate. If you extend that to the dual motor version with the big battery, it goes up to 301,900 RMB, which is about £33,000 and $41,700. So quite affordable actually. Certainly this car is positioned significantly cheaper than its big brother, the R7 SUV. And I'm not sure really what the differentiation is on those because I think as cars, they're actually both as capable as each other. This one actually has a better interior, I would say, than the R7. So yeah, I think you're getting more of a bargain with this car than you are with the R7. Depending on which version of the F7 you get, you get a choice of either Rising Pilot Lite or Rising Pilot Pro, which is their autonomous driving support system. It's level two, I would say, I think, for Rising Pilot Lite and level 2.5 for Rising Pilot Pro. With the Rising Pilot Lite, you will get a mobile eye chip. It will be an NVIDIA Orin drive chip for Rising Pilot Pro. And the LiDAR is optional, so you don't need it. We don't have it on our car. I tried it in practice. We have Rising Pilot Pro, by the way. Tried it in practice on the motorway earlier, and actually quite impressive. What I really like about it is the steering wheel is definitely capacitive, so you only need to have skin contact with the wheel. You don't have to have any force on there whatsoever, and it is satisfied that you're in control of the vehicle. So it does feel more hands-off than some other systems where the capacitive touch isn't quite as strong, or you do need to put a little bit of input in every now and then, a little bit of wiggle. It was really quite comfortable. It handled the obviously the highway driving part fine it transitioned between one highway to another totally fine a little bit slow in terms of overtaking every now and then tends to like sitting in the middle lane as well but if you do think it's a bit slow you can just put the indicator on and it'll make that decision for you glides across the lanes quite smoothly so no sharp interchanges between the lanes very good system i was impressed by it and it did make the journey here a lot more comfortable even if you know technically i'm still in control of the vehicle it did a really good job all on its own so that's it for our review of the Rising F7. Certainly a very competent car and one that does have some key features that separate it from the other cars in this category, such as eight inch rear screen, great driving position, and of course the hatch, which offers a different kind of practicality to the other sedans in this category. Yes, it's maybe not the most engaging car that we've driven, but it has plenty of power. And I think what it does best is actually the comfort and the ambience inside the cabin. You also get a lot of equipment in there, so it's very, very good value for money. I do think it's actually a bit of a hidden gem in the Chinese market. And maybe when the battery swapping comes on song, it becomes more of an attractive proposition for customers. I think it's great value for money and it looks pretty cool as well. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. And if you do, thank you for subscribing. We'll catch you next time.